one of the things that was wrong about this script? Okay, part of the script is when you, when you go to sit down, you have to listen. Okay? Um, James, James Berry, mm -hmm. oh, we're missing James Reynolds today. James Berry, give me another thing that was wrong about this script. He didn't really listen. He didn't give the, the customer a chance to talk. When he brought the food, he said, Murphy, what did he say? When he brought the food, he said, <laughs> Anybody? When he brought the food. Huh? Are you going to drink that? Are you going to drink that? And before he said, are you going to drink that, he said, you got, here's your pepperoni pizza. It's, yeah, it's awesome, I believe he said, or delicious. What is the, what does the, Waiter, what do you expect the waiter or waitress to say when they bring your food? Enjoy your dinner. Enjoy your, enjoy your dinner. There you go. And then, how long, Colton, before they come back and say what to you? Are you ready to leave? No, not yeah. are you ready to leave. We can tell who hasn't eaten out. <laughs> do you need anything else? Do you need anything else? How and is how is everything? How is everything? Those are the scripts that we expect. And even if you haven't been paying attention, as Colton obviously hasn't, I'd like to have Colton at, at my table because I can do anything and he won't pay attention. But even if you haven't been paying attention, when you hear the wrong thing, how do you feel? You hear the wrong thing, how do you feel? Awkward. Dujon? Awkward. Awkward. Sometimes offended. Mostly awkward. You feel that something's, something's amiss, right? Now, scripting, in, in this case, scripting, violating the script, is bad. What about in classes? What's a script that your professors might write for you? Yes. Dujon? A script that a professor might write is a test. Okay. What do you mean? How, how would that be a script? How is a test a script? Um, I think you're right. It's basically, um, he basically has to plan the procedure anyway because he has to um, figure out exactly what question he's going to be asking and what order, um, why he's asking you them specifically to target particular areas of knowledge or attention. Okay. okay. So the professor has to plan out the steps that you're going to take. Again, that's a fairly positive script. Give me a, 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 a negative script. Jessica, a negative script that a professor might write about you. Specifically about you. Okay. Well, what might a professor think about you and your in classroom behavior? Think a little bit about your in classroom behavior. Do you talk? Do you volunteer information in class? Sometimes. Okay. Do you volunteer information in classes outside your major? Yeah. Okay. Would I, should I expect you to volunteer information in this class? Okay. All right. So there's, there's an element of the script. What other script elements what might we write about Jessica? What have you noticed about Jessica's behavior? And this is not to pick on you, Jessica, but, but just to say we do typical things and from that we create scripts. What have, have you noticed anything about Jessica's behavior? Taryn, have you noticed anything? Aside from she's quiet? Notice that she's quiet. Yeah. She's not. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I just know her better. Sure. But I think in a classroom setting, yeah. She's very good. I just know Jessica better than other people because. Exactly. We room together, we're in the same corner and stuff, and I for sure know that she's not quiet. But she's quiet in the classroom. Oh, yeah. Sometimes. Moderately quiet. Moderately quiet. What else do you know about, what else can you tell us about Jessica that a professor might use to write a script? Is she always, is she always in time? Well, yeah, on occasion. Sometimes she might wander in a few minutes late. Yeah, she might, she might wander in a few minutes late. She's getting ready for class and she might wander in with her paper. So we, here's, here's the two things that a professor knows about Jessica. She's quiet 
She comes in late. What script is the professor going to write about Jessica? <laughs> hmm? What script? Now, what assumptions are, is he going to make? What script is the professor going to write about Jessica? Based on that, tardy. She's quiet and tardy. And tardy? Tardy. She's late. Uh -oh. What script? Oh, Ashley, what script <laughs> might a professor write about Jessica? Okay. Maybe she doesn't care about the class? It's not so much doesn't care, but this because that's not what our script is. Our script predicts action. So she's always gonna be late. She's always gonna be late. Am I ever gonna be worried if she's not in her seat? No. No. Because no. she'll show up when? Whenever. Whenever, eventually. She'll be here before Stephen, generally. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen. Stephen, mind you, is a communication major, so he knows that this grief is deserved. Okay. In this class, will the professor know, will the professor expect that she will simply volunteer her opinion? No. What happens, yeah, and the professor will then see her more superficially. Will not get to know Jessica the way Shelby does, never would know her the way Shelby does because they're roommates and that we don't want a professor moving in on those two. That, no, that would be real creepy. But would never really get to know Jessica. Consequently, what will be the basis of the professor's evaluation of Jessica? This classroom, this classroom alone. And if I have to give a grade to that, Jessica, what will I grade? Just and and that's going to be the papers, right? And the speech. So by withholding communication, by by just being that shy person, and we have several people who are very shy. What happens to your grade? What happens to your grade? Bobby. Probably goes down. Why? If I know somebody really well, and I'm going to grade, what do I do, Melody? You have like a bias towards them because you know their personality. Exactly. And you know everything about them. I have I have a bias toward people that I know well. So you know, Melody now is bucking up her grade. She's pushing a little bit. Not to say, but anyway, you guys don't know this. Well, oh, that is a symbol. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, then we'll just let it go. <laughs> but Melody, Melody is Melody is enhancing her grade by creating a situation in which she and I begin to have a relationship, a proper proper faculty student relationship, where she just volunteers and and she might even come up to me outside of class and go, "Hey, how are you doing?" And it might even no, it's not suck up. <laughs> Dujan, it is not suck up. Okay. So scripts powerfully affect how others come to see us. Violation of the script is a great way to get attention. If you want to get your grade to, to go up, sit in the magic tea, speak up once a class. Even if all you do is ask a question. If you will speak up once a class and sit toward the center and not try to get yourself as far away from it as you can. Even if you haven't done your work and you are late with an assignment and you have other problems in the class, you will boost your grade because the script the professor will write for you is Jessica comes early and has an interest in my class and I will take an interest in her, and I will give her the benefit of the doubt. Because when it comes to the end, everybody's got a chance to boost grades a little bit. All right. And so what we're dealing with is how you form impressions. We form them by self-fulfilling prophecies. Form them by self-fulfilling prophecy. Let me see, who, who haven't I gotten at today? Caden? 
girlfriend, a girlfriend, a girl you met, have you had this happen to you? You met this girl, she's absolutely gorgeous, and you say to yourself, she's too good for me. No, you've never met that girl. Yeah, okay, yeah, we'll go along with that. We'll go along with that. What happens if you say, she's too good for me, what do you do? You don't even try. You don't even try. That is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mike, am I right? That is a self and he has done this so many times. Go ahead, toss it to him if they if they really need it. He is, we know Caden's done this so many times. He's just put himself down. Ladies, this man needs this man needs some help. Right? Emily, am I right about this? This man needs some help. No. No. Okay. All right. Self-fulfilling prophecy. It often, often happens in romantic relationships, but it can happen in all kinds of relationships. You take a job, your first job. Where do you expect to work? Oh, look at this. Stephen is now being nice. There's a change. What? <laughs> he can't win this morning, can he? You take a job. Where's your first job going to be? James, where's your first job going to be? That, really? No. <laughs> minimum wage job? No, my first job was actually not minimum wage. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go after graduation? First job after graduation? Uh, hopefully residency, medical residency. Okay, so New York City? You want to go big time? I don't know about NYC, but I might go back to so you see yourself, you visualize yourself, you're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's a very positive one. Self-fulfilling prophecies can be very positive, they can be very negative. Those romantic self-fulfilling prophecies usually are negative. They're usually negative ones. They often are at the beginning of a relationship, or you've gotten into the relationship and you go, we're never going to make it. We're never going to make it. This is doomed. Doomed. And by gum, it is. <laughs> Second, we form stereotypes. This is what schemata become when you put a bunch of schemata together. Stereotype of a Japanese driver. <laughs> they drive on the wrong side of the road. Which is true. Yeah, this is... True. They, they drive on the opposite side of the road. Japanese driver. Stephen. Is it considered a stereotype if it's true though? Ah. So it's we'll come back to that. Hold on to that. That's a great, great, that's a great concept. Japanese driver. Give me a Japanese driver stereotype. I don't know about that. I always think of the little cars. Huh? <laughs> the little like economic cars. Little little, little cars. Yeah. Are Japanese drivers good drivers? No, no, no. Bad drivers, bad drivers. Okay. What are what are all Asian people good at? Math. 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 <laughs> so so what what was Jeremy Lin's major at Harvard? Economics. What was his major at Say it up louder. Economics. Economics. See? Chinese guy. Good at math. Right? So when you're in our math course, who teaches our math courses here? No. Ming Na? Yeah, she's from China. Chinese lady? Why are you guys all failing math? Why are you all failing math? Because you talk so fast. No, it's because we don't have enough Asian students here on campus for you to copy from. <laughs> stereotypes. Are stereotypes any less stereotypical if they're true? No, they're no less stereotypical. Is it possible that you could find an Asian person who is really bad at math? Absolutely. Could it be that Stephen, on whom I have picked unmercifully today, is good at math? No. Why not? He could be. He could be. Emily is, Emily's pointing out, he could be. But why would you assume, not knowing Stephen, why would you assume he's not good at math? 
good at football. Because he's good at football, right? But what about Michael? Michael's good at football, and he's also good at math. Mike's white, though. Oh, so race comes into it, too. It always does. In America, race comes into everything. You cannot escape. Why can't he? Why can't he dunk? Because why can't Michael dunk? No, Michael can't dunk because Michael is how tall? That's not why. Michael is five ten. And Michael weighs how much? I don't mean it. I know you, it's all meat. It's all it's all muscle, right? <laughs> Let's keep it that way. Stereotypes. Even if, even if there is truth in the stereotype, it's still a stereotype. We still got some time, guys. Implicit personality theory. The third thing that we do to, to manage impressions is we create implicit personalities. Implicit personality theory, rather. Dujan is always happy. I'm making one up. Okay. Um, Bobby is is always Bobby. <laughs> that unique character. That unique. Uh, we can't define it. We can't define it. We create personality theories, and then we tend to see the person by those personality theories. We deal with things in terms of primacy and recency. What's the most recent, uh, the most recent experience I have had of any student? That's the one that I'm going to remember. What was the first experience of that student? I'm very likely to remember that. So that, for example, in the case of Melody, she was the first person in the classroom on the first day, and she was wearing a, a pair of glasses that day that were kind of funky. Her whole look was kind of funky, and I remember that because that's a primacy issue. That was the first impression. First impressions stick. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. It's a cliche, but keep it in mind. There's a lot of truth in it. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. So the first time people meet you, what do you want them to see? Think about that in terms of in terms of potential employers. Dedicated early. Exactly. Exactly. So you want to go in that suit and tie, that that business attire, polished shoes, and you want to be early, but you don't want to be eager. You don't want to be over. You want to go over the top. First impression. Primacy. We also go by recency. What's the thing that I remember most recently? So now I'm going to carry out of the classroom today a new impression of Jessica that will be maybe validated the next time that I see her. May not be. And then finally, we attribute motive to what people do. We attribute motive to what people do. The whole uh, attribution theory was, was um, first uh, studied by a fellow by the name of Fritz Heider here in Kansas in the 40s. It was a great interest in motivation. Why do people do what they do? Because if I know why people do what they do, what can I get them to do? If I know why you do what you do, Dujan says I can get you to do anything. Is that true, Ashley? Can I get you to do more things? If I know why you do what you do, I can get you to do more of what I want. Right? So attribution was a big, a big part of, the, uh, uh, of uh, the study of motivation. And we were very interested in how we motivate people. Extrinsically and intrinsically. Extrinsically and intrinsically. We motivate people in all kinds of ways. Fritz Heider then developed a, uh, an an impression that people were making a mistake in, in their attribution. And he called it the fundamental attribution error. And he said, we attribute too much of our success 
to things that are inside of us and too much of our failures to things that are outside of us. And we attribute too much of others' success to things that are outside of them and too much of their failure to things that are inside of them. So if I am judging why, let's say, Katie succeeds, she succeeds if I make the fundamental attribution error, Katie succeeds because of what? See, she said something nice. She, she spoke up in class. What else? What about a test? Why does Katie get an A on the test and Emily get a, get a D? Now that's hmm? because she's sitting in the she's sitting in the magic row. Or what about haven't you ever had tests that where the professor asked all the wrong questions and you flunked it? It wasn't your fault. He or she asked the wrong questions. I just happened to ask all the right questions. Why did Katie fail? Now it's reversed. Katie's getting the D. Katie's getting the F. Emily's getting the A. Why did Katie fail? She didn't study. Simple, right? That's to make the fundamental attribution error. If I ascribe to you the good that comes is from outside of you and the bad is inside, and to me, the good that comes is from the inside and the bad is from the outside, I'm making the fundamental attribution error. Because in reality, if we fail to do something, why do we fail? Why do we fail when we fail? Some, somewhat. But sometimes we fail because of things that are out of our control. All of these things are, are part of our perceptual processes. And we make judgments very quickly about things we see. Aren't they cute? <laughs> and what our textbook ends with is an, a plea to increase your accuracy. And I'm not going to go over it because we've, we've hit 10 o'clock. You guys are, are chomping at the bit, ready to go. So we're not going to keep you any longer on this one. But the plea to increase your accuracy in your perception. And there are a number of steps. <laughs> there are a number of steps you can take to increase your accuracy. You'll find them in the, in the textbook. The key notion is look before you leap to a conclusion. Because just like that piece of optical illusion, a lot of what we think we see isn't really there. Okay? So there is a quiz now on chapter two. It covers all this stuff that we've been over, including the Joe Harry window, self-disclosure. Of course, this long section on perception. Self-confidence. Self Okay, we'll take a look at when the quiz is. We will give you a look at when the quiz opens and when it closes. Before we go. Okay, Megan, is that enough for you or do you want me to go over a little bit? Okay. Uh, Cecilia, could, you, um, could I talk to you after class? Yes. All right. Um, the new quiz. Quiz number two is open and it's due, it says it's due on the 21st. That is incorrect. Because today, as it says 11 p.m. tonight. Yeah. Oh, you can get it done by then. No. no. It's 10 questions. Oh. Since the last one. You guys did super oh, on the last one. one. Oh. <laughs> Don't forget your second writing needs to be in. Get that in, guys. Get those in. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you on Thursday when we go on to listening. Listening. Thank <laughs> you.